you ever want to fly over there and get a 900 pounder? Yeah, for sure. I'd love to go to, uh, I didn't know they got that. Scotia. I didn't know they got that big. I think the biggest ever caught was in the Atlantic. It was like 1900 pounds, 1900 pound bluefin tuna giant. Yeah. It's as big as this room. Yeah. Yeah. So they can get, they can get really, really big. Oh, wow. Hey everybody, friends, I would like to welcome you back to Chats and Tats with me, your host, Aaron Della Vidova. Today's uh, guest is, he, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. He's a really good friend. He's a good friend of my wife's. He grew up with my wife. I mean, the connections between this man and one of my good buddies, my wife's cousin Jason's one of his best buds. So that those people drew him into my life. Uh, but then once I started tattooing him and getting to know him, I mean, I don't know what word to use other than soul brother. I mean, I feel like me and him just connected at that level the day I met him. I love this guy, you know, and that's enough, right? But that's not why I had him on today. I think there's a piece to his life that is extremely inspiring. It is to me, and I think it will be to you. He made some bold moves to just change it up and it's paid off. He's living his dream today because of it. And uh, I want you guys to hear about it. So without further ado, please welcome my great friend, Grant Morgan. Thanks, Aaron. You're welcome. Stoked to be here, dude. Yeah. Really, really pumped to be a part of your next chapter. Me too, dude. I mean, and you know, it's appropriate because I'll just blow it right now, but I've been working on a leg sleeve with you. That's a massive project. You're not a little dude. And uh, we're finishing that piece today. Yeah. So it's yeah. the show, finish the piece. I've it's almost been avoiding it because it's like it represents the end. And I'm like, oh, we're going to have to figure out another project. You got a lot of skin. This can't be the end. Yeah, no. We're, I'm not quitting. Got You're canvas not canvas all day. <laughs> well, let's get right to it. I mean, you know, like I had said in my, my introduction, one of the, the parts of your life that I find extremely inspiring and fascinating, and it's something that a lot of people don't do, and that you, you, you kind of were bold enough to find your dream. You know, what you really want, and maybe that dream will change. I'm not talking about the rest of your life. You might pop off to something else. But for, for a lot of your life, you had a dream and you had a passion for fishing. I yeah. mean, you, man, I've met people who love to fish, but I don't know if I've ever met someone quite as, I don't want to use, psychotic. I don't know. Uh, what do we call it? You're just, you're just really obsessed. <laughs> obsessed. That's yeah. the word. You're obsessed. Yeah. You are obsessed. So I want to hear about that. I want to hear when this obsession starts, how life drags you into the real world, we'll call it, you know, grow up, get a job, all that shit, and how in a full circle way, it comes on back to the dream. Yeah. Well, that's a long story, but we'll try and make it quick. Um, <laughs> Give us the highlights. You know, I don't know. I uh, I grew up on a ranch uh, up in North County, uh, San Diego. And, and uh, we were, uh, my brother and I, Scott, we were ranch kids, you know, and we've, we we We'd go fishing with our old man. He had keys to the uh, the reservoirs for the orange groves, and and um, he'd take us out and we'd go fish, you know, for largemouth bass and whatever else was in those freshwater things. fishing, and freshwater yeah. stuff, you know. And and uh, as we got a little older, we kept kind of going west. <laughs> and Wait, where was this ranch? Uh, where are we at right now? Uh, oh, you said Northern California, so no, no, no North County, San Diego. Oh, North yeah, County, Bonzel. okay, yeah, where where I ended up uh, going to high school. So right. and. I, first four years of my life, I lived in Palm Valley, which is west of, or east of there. But we used to go to the beach, you know, and Scott and I would be like, Dad, isn't that a big ass pond? You know, can we go fish that? <laughs> and one day we finally did. And it was like, I mean, the diversity and the different things that we caught was just out of control, you know. And so um, we immediately were hooked. I mean, I was just like, we, we want to, that's all I want to do, you know. I mean, I, let's get on, let's get on the ocean. All right. right? Where the real and, fish uh, are. <laughs> so we had a little boat. We took a little 12 footer and then we got a little 14 footer and we had a 16 footer, you know, and one day we came with my, my dad and I went out at the time I was, uh, I was also raising cattle for, uh, for 4-H, um, which is kind of how I'd make money and, you know, bought my first car and all that stuff. And, uh, we had one that was one steer that was rank. I mean, this thing tried to, t it almost killed my dad. It almost killed me. There was no way I was taking it to the fair. Right. And so we sold it to our vet and we, we had it uh, terminated on site and I was pumped. I was like, all right, 
when they do it, I want to collect the blood. So we, we collect the blood in a bucket and, and I froze it. And so we took this little 16 foot boat out, fast forward a little bit, you know, this was the old man and, and, um, went a little out into the, you know, deeper than we'd ever been, you know, and I put this bucket over the side, we'd put some holes in it. And next thing you know, we have like 15 sharks around the boat, you know, oh, and, man. and, uh, pops is like, what the fuck, you know, <laughs> I mean, he was tripping and I remember never forget that night. He, uh, I was sitting at the dinner table and he turns to me and he goes, so you could like doing that, you know? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, all right, we're going to need another, we're going to need a bigger boat. Right. <laughs> and so he goes, it's coming out of your college fund and uh, you're going to go to school to run it. You're going to be the captain. Oh. And I was 13. Um, so I ended up going to power squadron courses, which is like kind of like a coast guard certification thing sitting with my dad because I was too young to take the, to take the tests and went through that whole process. Only A's I got in high school. Um, <laughs> and that was kind of the beginning. And that from that point on, I was the captain. I was the one who ran ran the boat every time we'd go fishing. And uh, we ended up with a 20 footer and kind of just, you know, progressed from there. My brother fit perfectly in, into into sort of the first mate role. He was my uh, my number two. An, an insanely good angler, really good at catching fish. Okay. But for me, the passion was, was about the experience. It was about kind of like being out there, being responsible for the boat, being responsible for finding the fish mm -hmm. and that whole process. And I, I think it made it sort of naturally paired with Scott's abilities as an, as an angler. And so that was what we kind of groomed all through high school. And cause it really is a team sport, right? In, for sure. In, in, in this, for especially sure. in competitive deep sea fishing. To get the boat guy, he's running radar. He's checking the undersea maps to see. Yep. So that's his job to find those fish. And then you got the anglers who yep. it's like, they're out there, get them. And there's then a yeah. massive amount of preparation. You know, I remember being a kid and I'd be <laughs> stashing granola bars and extra water on the boat. You know, we're going out for like eight hours, you know, and I'm like ready in case we go to, we're going to drift for, you know, it would be a drift for two months, you know, and then, then, you know, listen to the listening on the radio from Bonzel, you know, we get the little crackled uh, weather report, you know, <laughs> when you turn on the VHF from the, from the trailer, you know, at, at home. So um, anyway, it was, uh, that was what it became for me. It was really about sort of taking that role and, and that's so how that's kind of what it had always been. We ended up getting a uh, 26 foot boat from our cousin called the Il Delfino, which is uh, it's uh, Italian for the dolphin. Um, we painted his boat up in up in uh, Puget Sound and got that and brought it down and fixed it and got that running. And then anyway, so that that uh, then we moved on to uh, a 26 foot boat and then a 30 foot, 31 foot boat, which is the one that we own now. So that was kind of the fishing deal, but. That's where uh, the, the seed was planted. This is where the passion. That, that's, yeah, that's where it sort of all became a thing. And it was been a part of my life, my whole life. Um, it's what I spent all my money on, no matter what my career was. And it's what I did with all my spare time, mm -hmm. um, you know, regardless of my career. And um, so, yeah, it's it's been there for forever. Um, from a like life and career perspective, you know, I came out of uh, college. I I went and uh, worked for the Winter Olympics in 2002 um, as an operations guy. I was in the event business, uh, did a couple of Super Bowls, a couple of U.S. Opens. And then uh, I also uh, started a business at one point uh, making manufacturing leather golf bags uh, for, for Titleist. We used to make like high end, you know, luxury stuff. And my last gig in the event business was... Uh, was in Australia and in, in Melbourne, um, working for the, uh, the 2006 Commonwealth games. And that was a really cool experience. Got to go live overseas, you know, and, um, all my mentors in that line of the business had always told me, you know, like, you got to get out of here, dude, don't stay in this business. And they're all older. Right. You know, and they're like, you're going to be a gypsy. You're gonna be like me. And I always thought they were cool, you know, but mm -hmm. I got back and didn't really have anything going on. So I ended up, Picking up a project management certificate, time off, bought a boat, my time off, fished all summer. It was great. And then uh, ended up getting a job with AT&T of all places and and um, progressed over my longest stint, 13 years, um, and became uh, ended up running a $30 million a year um, IT outsourcing business for them. And uh, that was up until just before COVID. Mm -hmm. They, um, in their constant quest for cost reductions, offered up a uh, voluntary severance slash 
early retirement for executives. I was in that class. My next job was in Dallas as a VP, which was like an absolute non-starter because of no ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I took get, I took it and, uh, that was a little bit of a surprise for them. You know, I was, um, I was one of their better folks, I think, you know, it was one of those jobs that most people don't walk away from. Definitely not. Definitely not. I mean, you were set, right? That's the job. You just stay with it. You're going to make good money. You're going to retire. Everyone fights tooth and nail to get to that. And you were there and you, and you walked. You're getting a lot of benefits. They're putting you on, you know, vesting options. You know, there's just, there's money there. You're getting very well paid. Um, I personally was in a, a high potential program, you know, they were doing things for me, hmm. but one thing they weren't going to do for me was make it happen in San Diego. And, and I just went, you know, I've been around the world. I've, I've traveled and this is where I'm going to end up and this is where I want to be. So, and then this offer for a year's pay, you know, and, and clearing my, my options over the following three years came up and I was like, dude, I'm out. And they were like, you're 43. You crazy? I was like, <laughs> yeah. And actually, subsequently, at the, around that same time, one of my buddies who's in a startup in, in IT was like, "Hey, you want to do a sprint with me? I've got the gig. You're gonna pick it up. You're you're gonna you're a perfect guy. Um, couple of years, and you're done forever, right?" And I'm like, "All right, I can get down with that." So uh, I left in 2019. Uh, end of 2019, <clears throat> I had about, I, I told the, I told my buddy, I was like, Hey, I'm not starting for like three months. Like, I'm going to go just chill, decompress. So me and my homie, Adam, uh, is the captain of one of the boats that I worked on. Uh, I was like, dude, let's go to Costa Rica. And so we went down there. We were there for like three, three weeks, um, chilling in Costa Rica, fishing, just having a blast, you know, and, and, uh, we're in the middle of the jungle and I get two phone calls. One, is my wife and Janine and Janine's like, have you been looking at the news? This is March, 2020. <laughs> She's like, you should come home. The world is ending. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I get, and I'm like, you should come here. Like <laughs> definitely better and probably safer, you know? But anyway, um, I get a call from my buddy from the startup and he's like, bro, we're tightening it up. COVID we're not going to make the hire. And so I'm like, all right, and I'll never forget, I sat down with Adam uh, at dinner that night, and he's like, oh, sorry to hear about it, bud. You know, and I'm like, that's all right. And he goes, we're going to fish a lot. <laughs> and that was sort of the beginning. I mean, COVID happened. It was back here. Nobody was doing anything. Um, I got a commercial license for my boat. It was the only way to get on the bay. You couldn't even actually – if you're out there as, as a boater, the – the Homeland Security would stop you and be like, what are you doing out here? But if you're commercial, you could go out, pull out your commercial license and you're good to go. So we got a commercial license, started fishing, you know, and, and, uh, and then my buddy Adam ended up, uh, taking a job as the captain of, uh, one of the boats I work on an 85 foot, uh, uh, expedition boat called the Castigo. And I knew the owner I'd worked, I'd fished with him the year before a little bit. And, uh, he's like, can Grant be my first mate? And Larry's like, for sure. Like you're in. So that was like my first gig um, starting in like April of, of 2020. And so I worked a little bit with him. I picked up a freelance job with another boat uh, that summer and kind of went all, you know, all summer. Ended up fishing that year. I fished 120 days, um, 120 days at sea, which uh, for me was a, was a big change. And it was something that I'd always wanted to do. And, you know, I've, I live sort of by these two principles of in fishing, of, you know, it's, everything is about technique and, and repetition. And, you know, I'd always honed technique. I'd always honed technique as a captain. I have a fairly good instincts when it comes to um, the angling side of it. So I'm good at kind of chipping in my, my thoughts to the guys on deck. And, uh, but repetition was one thing we didn't have, you know, and we'd always compared ourselves Maybe this is, you know, one of those things in, in life. If, if you're doing something, you should be kind of matching yourself up against the best, you know, even if you're a weekend warrior, you know, what is it, what does greatness look like? What does success look like? You know? And so I knew that the only way that I would ever be able to test that was with more time on the water. And so that year was the year that really gave me the opportunity to see what, repetition was going to do in this thing that I'd done my whole life that I loved more than 
anything, you know, less family. And so that, that was kind of the beginning. Um, that fall we did, a the Castigo goes to Cabo every year. Um, and so we did a 12 day trip from San Diego to Cabo San Lucas and fished our whole way, the whole way down there and got down there and, uh, the old captain of the Castigo who got picked up another, another gig, um, came up to me and he goes, Hey, I need a guy. I need, I need a tournament guy to fish this tuna tournament. That's a big tournament, right? Is it? Which yeah, it's is, the biggest, uh, biggest tuna tournament on the West coast. It's, uh, this is the big one. Yeah. Oh, wait. yeah. Tuna specifically. Tuna specifically. What type uh, of tuna? Does it have to be? It's well in Cabo, the only qualifying tuna you're going to catch is the yellowfin tuna. So, okay. Everyone out there is trying to catch the biggest yellowfin tuna. Yeah. And yeah. it's what, you have three days or how many? Days? Uh, two days and about 200 boats. Okay. And, you know, the uh, decent pot, I think the overall pot is at the time for that year, I think was just over a million dollars. Damn. You know. The, and that's just biggest fish takes all. Yeah. There's no second place, third place, none of that shit. There is. So it's dailies. They call them dailies. Each day there's a jackpot and there's different classes of the jackpot. So you can put in 500 bucks, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, even 10,000 in some tournaments. And that's a per day entry. Plus you have a base entry for the whole tournament. Mm. So each day, if you, you know, you can go in and catch a really big fish one day and win that daily in that whole category. Mm. Um, but you can, and, and then the next day say, but it depends if you catch a really big fish, if other people aren't in all those categories, then you might win some, or you could win all if you're in all the categories. Right. So you want to, you want to be working for an owner who's all in, which this particular guy ha happened to be, but it's one of those things for first, second, third place, like, the boat that makes the most money wins. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a reality of it, I guess you would say, you know, I mean, um, when it comes to tournament fishing, at least between the community and, and, you know, you don't want to be on a boat that, that won it and wasn't, wasn't all in, you know? And so, so you're the boat wins that million dollars you're talking about. You not only have to catch the biggest fish, but that owner of that boat had to have been all in financially. They pay yeah. to be yeah. on the water that day for the chance to mm -hmm. win that biggest fish up so, to $10,000. So that year, 2020, perfect example, we we ended up uh, taking the second day daily and we were all in and it was a $320,000 jackpot. Mm. We got second place by one pound to a local boat that was in a five hundred dollar jackpot, and they won sixty thousand. So um, we technically got second place, but we were the money winner. The first day there were smaller fish caught, and they got distributed amongst a bunch of different boats. So that year we were the standout boat money winner. Money, you know, we took the took the most money in that in that tournament, and so that was a that, that was, was a big your deal. That was when I called you. Actually, yeah, yeah. that that night after a couple of cocktails, actually after a giant bottle of tequila, and I was like, dude, you'd sent something up. You're like, hey, I've got like five hours, you know, like you put it up on Instagram or whatever. You know, you're yeah. like anybody wanted to get get something done. And I'm like, I called you and I was just like, hey, let's do something cool. Like, you know, this year has been crazy. 2020 has blown my mind and I just won this term and I'm down here in Cabo like Let's do something, you know, and, and that kind of, if correct me if I'm wrong, that was really the beginning of like full on professional fisherman life. From Obviously, point, you don't get the whole three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Everybody, the boat gets its right. chunk. Everybody gets a chunk. You got a nice chunk. Yep. But you also correct me if I'm wrong, but you you now you, you people can wreck. You're in the scene and people know. And wasn't there did you kind of adjust some of the fishing technique to, to, to win that? Was Am I wrong about that? Yeah, it was. um it was interesting. So the fish that we fish up here in San Diego right now is bluefin tuna. We're having a a, a bite, if you will, it's that we haven't seen in a hundred years. Um, the population of of tuna and the proximity from San Diego that to, you have to go to fish them it hasn't been seen since uh, the days of I call it the days of Zane Gray, who's a kind of like we call him the Godfather, or grandfather of sport fishing, who used to write books back in the 1920s about trying to catch tuna in Southern California. They called the Southern California bite, which is kind of like the bay that represents the Cal uh, SoCal and the islands off of, off of SoCal. He's, he talks about um, pursuing these fish that he couldn't catch. The equipment wasn't capable of it. 
Mm. And um, we're having a bite up here that's just off the chain. And um, back then, and this the technique that we use now, one of the most effective ways is with a kite um, and utilizing flying fish, which are natives here in the summer. And you fish a, uh, you fish a kite to, attached to a separate rod, and then you have your rod that goes up to that kite and then down to a flying fish, which is rigged um, dead with its wings out hooks, hooks in it. But the way that that kite presents, presents that flying fish, there's no line in the water. And all that fish sees is the silhouette of a flying fish. And then and it's you're, popping out of the waves and diving into right. the wave, just like a real live flying fish would yeah. behave. Yeah. So the movement of that. And, How and new is that tech? When did, when did kite, this kite fishing? Start? It was, I think it was like around 1920 when it first came out. Oh, so it's been uh, around a while. First started really getting utilized. I think it, it, they say that the, the Hawaiians may have invented it. But it got used here in the like 1918, 1920s um, in Southern California. But it, it dropped off because we couldn't find those fish. They weren't they weren't that big here anymore. And you know, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that's been done recently that's trying to figure out why they're here. We did a tagging program with Stanford University this last summer. Um, took them out and and met with one of the top scientists who's telling us that the conservation effort, which is like a global conservation effort around all of the Pacific, you know, these fish are born here, travel to um, Japan to breed and and then live there. They never come back. Um, we catch, you know, the biggest fish we can catch here is 300 pounds and they get to they, they end up off New Zealand at 900 pounds. Right. We never see them again. They're all juveniles here. She's saying that the the, the way that the conservation is, has been done over the last 10 or 15 years has had a huge, huge impact. And that's why we're seeing them. So you're not seeing juveniles. You're starting to see adults. No, we're seeing up to 300 pounds. But but prior to that, you'd go out and you'd catch a 50 pounder. You okay. know, and my brother caught a 70 pounder back in like 2000 or no, it was like 98. I'll never forget it because he got the jackpot on the boat and I caught a shark the whole day. I was so pissed. <laughs> and uh, he's, he was in the newspaper and he's up there holding it, you know, and I'm in the back stripping line, fucking just torqued, you know, my little <laughs> brother beat me. But um, yeah, so we didn't see big fish, you know, we catch a hundred pounder here in the, here in the news and now, now they're up over 300 pounds. We set the like, well, I guess it would be the record, set it twice um, in the last in the well since 2017 uh we caught a 289 pounder which was the biggest since 1984 at the time um and then we caught a 375 Oof. three years ago which was the biggest ever um caught on hook and line and we got beat like another a week later it was good fishing because they're, they were just coming yeah but um, those fish all leave um at that year if you will of their life. They move from, um, from Southern California to, uh, to Japan to breed and they never come back. Mm -hmm. they, when they show up here, they're like five pounds. And so this is the nursery for, for that species. Interesting. Anyway, back to the point, uh, you ever want to fly over there and get a 900 pounder? Yeah, for sure. I'd love to go to, uh, I didn't know they got that. Scotia. I didn't know they got that big. I think the biggest ever caught was in the Atlantic. I think it was like 1,900 pounds. 1,900 pound pounds. bluefin tuna? Giant. Yeah. It's as big as this room. Yeah. Yeah. So they can get. They can get really, really big. Oh, wow. I mean, all fish are indeterminate. So as long as there's food, they, they just will keep, keep growing. growing right? They don't stop growing. Generally, they all, they mostly die of starvation. So I mean, they keep feeding. Yeah. Oh. So. I'm learning so much today. I don't know any of this stuff, but it's fascinating. And when you come back a little bit, you said because of the convers they think because of the conservation efforts over the last 10 years, 20 years. Yeah, uh, 10, 10 so to 12 a bunch years, of new I think laws is what she said. Have been made to protect, yep. you know, laws that keep them from killing the babies, I'm assuming, and and not overfishing them. Quotas. And, yeah. And bringing quotas down, like yeah. you can't have a hundred bluefin on your boat, you can have five or whatever the so that's been going on for 20 years. And because of that, we're seeing a rebound in the population. For sure. I mean, so the the 300 pounders that are here that are leaving to go and breed are eight years old. So if you think about a population that, that gets to, to maturity, breeding maturity in eight years, you can start to see a significant change in population in 12, right? right. I mean, or, or less. So, and that, that has sort of a, 
compounding effect as you as you continue that. And that's one of the things they're concerned about because the population is definitely up. I mean, what we're seeing now is uh, we haven't seen in 100 years. If everybody goes, wow, OK, we're done. Right. And and those those quotas then we'll just beat it back, back down back, again. We'll just pound it right back down. Well, I just like that you so. told me that because I feel like nowadays, every time I read anything about the planet and the animals, it's just dooming. Like you don't know. You don't hear the story of conservation efforts like working, working. very often. Yep. <laughs> That's, yep. That makes me feel better. Like, well, something in the oceans actually doing better than yeah. it used to do. Yeah, for That's sure. That's cool. For sure. I mean, you know, there's climate change factors and stuff, too. But but uh, those are in some areas they're beneficial you know i think that that's one of the things of some of the stuff i've been reading and listening to it's like you know with climate change what's happening around you know around the world it actually is going to benefit a lot of america like our our midwest is going to become wetter and maybe even be and, and with the warmth will allow us to have two crops instead of one instead of freezing over right i mean that's mm. kind of gnarly because somewhere else somebody's starving but mm. But these changes have have effects locally in different ways, you know, and so it could benefit an area. Well, yeah, right. So warmer water in Southern California makes these fish come closer. There's more bait, right? So it's affecting possibly as a factor, you know, mm -hmm. it's affecting the um, the fishing here, and it's in San Diego and Southern California. It's as good as it's been in 100 years. It's awesome. I'm not so, gonna start getting into fish. I think I've picked. I, this is the moment. I'm ready to start. I'm ready I've been to waiting for this. I'm re I've been waiting for this cycle. Now, yeah. I'm, now I'm ready. Well, I'll get you and Holly out there. <laughs> see, who, we'll see, who, see who takes for, the bigger For fish. sure. Like, when, then let me talk about that. What is the season for bluefin? Well, it keeps getting earlier. Um, right now, those fish are somewhere probably 150 miles southwest of San Diego, maybe 200 miles southwest. Actually, to check that. They're probably 250 now. Um, by March, we might start seeing some of them funnel up um there's rumor that some fish haven't even left they're small the small ones but the big stuff comes in usually may june okay. sets up shop until november and you can usually go somewhere within 100 miles and, and be on you know uh triple so this is this is it pounds. this is our summer we're getting me you holly i know Let's you're a busy it. guy you do this yeah, for sure. a living now but find me a find me a gap in there i want to go out with you and i want to i want to catch one it doesn't have Definitely. to be a record breaker i just want to catch one we'll get you out i'd be, awesome. I'd be stoked to do that and sure. then so they're that's interesting so they're down south off of mexico and they slowly start coming north as the water gets warmer yeah how far north do they go before they so that's a, another interesting factor. So working with these Stanford folks this year, which is really, I mean, probably one of the coolest fishing experiences I've ever had. We got to take out the scientists um, and they kind of picked our boat because we've done well, you know, over the last few years. And, and we ended up really, we tagged and released 14 fish, um, 13 over hundred pounds, and two over 200 pounds in one day, mm. um, hands down the best single day of fishing we've ever had. And I love uh, how it's the day the scientists are there. Oh, it was killer, dude. You know, Adam calls me on the way. I'm, I'm we're about to get to the boat, you know, and he's like, dude, this is our shot. Like, we're going to show people what's up, you know? And I'm like, I was, we were just excited, you know what I mean? And like, man, like, yeah, we, they, we get one day, one shot. They, they previously, they go out and they do these programs every year. It's like they catch one or they catch none. Right. right. And we just happen to have a really killer day and we got to, we saw the finish. We saw the light at the end of the tunnel. I was like, dude, okay, let's press this. I'm like, how many tags you got? Let's do them all. You know, and <laughs> we came up too short of of totally eliminating all of their tags. But they put satellite tags. Um, they do uh, inside the body, like body temperature tags, light tags. It's, the, it's crazy the amount of stuff that they put in. Mm -hmm. I think we put forty five thousand dollars worth of gear in these mm -hmm. fish that we that we sent off. But she's got migration patterns all the way up to um, Central California, which some okay. some folks might know that you know they're they're starting to see big bluefin tuna like off Morro Bay. So not, nothing Oregon Washington no, yet, but not. they do make it that far possibly later. Okay. Yeah. So now it's going to be later in the summer though. Yeah. By that time. And then the southern boundary is is maybe two thirds of the way down Cabo. Okay, that's um, the range. Yeah. They live around here, and then at some point they eight years old. They know intuitively. They yep. swim across the entire world. Yep. To over there, Japan, across the largest ocean anywhere. on the planet. And, uh, and then they the do that in one year or how long does it take them to get the data? I don't know. That's, that is one of the main reasons why these, this tagging program is going to learn this. They've now. got all these patterns on the, uh, in the, in, with the juvenile fishery, the one on the, on the Eastern Pacific that we fish, but they don't have 
an observed satellite based path and timeline for those fish that leave here when they're mature and go to Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, there's two spots, Northern Japan and, and an area off South China sea. They're fit. They're finding them mostly in Northern Japan right now was where they're, where they're spawning. And then from there they slide down, um, through like Indo and, and end up, you know, off New Zealand. And I think they go back and forth from there to, to continue to breed as they're mature. And they so, never return. Once they get over there, they, yeah. that's where they live forever. Yeah. They spawn those eggs hatch. Those, those, those juvenile, the very small fish grow to a few, a few pounds. And then that's gotta be the gnarly run. I mean, you're the ones running back you're, here, your bait and you got to run, you know, a couple thousand miles to the east, to, you know, on instinct. And they have no idea yet. This this stuff you were working with these people on, they're going to now know the route they take, yep. how long it takes them. And then I'm assuming they're going to tag some juveniles and find out their route and how long it takes them. That's right. Yeah. So they've been doing this for, I don't know, I think 15 or 20 years. They've, but um, they do it for, for tuna, uh, for, for marlin, billfish, and for shark. And uh, it's a really cool program. A woman named Barbara Block um, at Stanford has has been doing for for a few years, and she's she's awesome. She was super super knowledgeable. I mean, we were just like kids, you know, like tell us everything you know because we want to know, you know, we want to understand them as best mm-hmm. we can. So anyway, that was uh, that was really cool. I'm learning a little bit about that. But you'd asked about kite fishing, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that the Cabo tournament, we took this flying fish technique that we use for bluefin. And, um, we had, I'd come down on the, on the Castigo and we'd seen this, this bank that had fish on it. And, uh, I was like, I want to fish that first day. The wind was too, too bad out there. And so, um, as the tournament specialist, I, you know, I work with the captain and I kind of direct how things are going to work. And it just happens to be on this boat, but, um, where we fish techniques, all that I get to guide, you know? And so I said, Hey, we're going to go fish this on Sunday. And so we went out and set up a a balloon because there wasn't enough wind for a kite. So if you don't have enough wind, you can't, the kite won't even fly. And you put a, you put a helium balloon on even, even then on top of the kite, but sometimes it's too much weight. Anyway, we used just a straight balloon tied to this rig that we'd, we'd kind of perfected over the, over the past five, four, four or five years. And, uh, with a flying fish that I had brought down on the Castigo from San Diego, frozen, right. Defrosted, put its wings out, hook in the back and we're right on top of the bank. No one was on this bank. Everybody f- was offshore doing what everybody down there does to catch blue- to catch yellowfin for the tournament. And we're on this one bank by ourselves with a like a ponga who's like not a tournament, obviously hand lining, you know, r- rockfish. And it was like 15 minutes after we got there, the black porpoise came in. And a lot of times these big tuna will run with the porpoise. And these porpoise start kind of creeping in and started working the balloon. And it's just, I mean, the, the bite when you have a, a bait out of the water or that's, you know, on, on the surface like that, and you're moving it is insane. I mean, the fish come completely out of the water, just destroy the bait. And so that was a pretty epic moment. I was like, oh, this is, this is, this is the right condition, guys. These, are, these porpoise might have fish on them. And then, boom, just absolutely ma- massive, massive hit. That's cool. Um, you know, that's a cool story. I mean, it's kind of like I grew up, you know, more in Iowa and in other places. My dad moved over the years, but it's all deer hunting, elk hunting. And I don't know, for me, I never viewed fishing like hunting. You know, I, I know what it means to stalk a deer or an elk. And I think most people understand that. Like, yeah. you're sneaking around you know, listening, staying downwind, That's right. all these things. But I don't think a lot of people view fishing like that. I think a lot of people just view it as, oh, I get it. You go out, you park the boat, you throw right. shit in the water. And it's like, kind of like yep. a slot machine. Totally. Maybe I'll get a fish. But it's, it is at this level, especially like hunting. Yep. I mean, you are hunting these fish. hundred you know? percent. You know, you, you mentioned the wind, you know, that's, it's, it's a, an interesting uh, parallel. So when you're hunting on land, you have to take into account the wind, right? Well, when you're hunting in the water, you need to take into account the water version of wind, which is current. Right. right. And understanding how current works and how current affects structure, you know, whether it's structure at 500 feet or a thousand feet or, or a rock at 50 feet, it's all the same. The way the way current comes over structure affects and upwells what's happening, you know, what's, what's mm-hmm. on that structure, which then creates, you know, microplankton or, you know, small, small fish that small fish then come and eat. And so you have what we see is bait fish that's, that's now 
feeding off of those upwellings and the current is the wind for them. They're hunting. So you're hunting predators who are hunting predators, right? Mm -hmm. And so everything orients itself into that current and, and usually up in front of that structure. And then you have, bait. so that's your bait you right. fall, eating these, these, you know, small stuff. that's really not running. And then the big fish who are, are going to come in from behind. Right now, you don't necessarily have to hide from them, but you have to take into account the orientation of those fish. And, you know, one of the things that we've always noticed with like with tuna dragging bait through dragging your, your, your rigs through the, through them from behind is counterintuitive, right? Right. Um, that doesn't feel right. To you need fish. to be presented in front of them and running away. Not like, Oh, what is this? Oh, it just passed me. And I, <laughs> and I would normally eat it. Like this thing's not, doesn't care, you know? So it's that kind of stuff. It's just, it's the same They're smarter thing. than you think. Yeah. They're you know, not stupid. Water temperature and you know, the, the hard bottom versus soft bottom. I mean, there's so many variables. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things kind of, as a captain, it, you spend a lot of time working on, you know, not while you're on the water and continuing to gather information as much as you possibly can from people who are out there looking at, you know, at the different capabilities that some of the new satellites that we have up can do. So there's a way now where you can get uh, water temperature at depth from a satellite. So you can see temperature gradients at 50 meters or 100 meters down, which has different effects and allows you to start to correlate and it's wow. all it's like big data my wife is a data scientist and i mean it's i wish i could plug some of this stuff in and really start thinking about it like that but that's there's another, so many variables well it's that's crazy. just a whole other thing you're describing now so it's not just going out fishing all day becoming a better fisherman you're at home on a computer yeah researching getting the newest technology definitely oh, cool. working your network you know um, meaning network, mean calling your friends, like, captains. where were you today? What'd you see? For sure. And that's sure. all relationships. So yeah. the more, you know, networking relationships you have, more successful you're going to yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is serious a business, dude. Right? There, there's a million dollars on the line. People aren't fucking around. When it is a competition, yeah. it's, it's You don't get the network doesn't talk. <laughs> no, no. I was telling somebody the other day, though, it's kind of funny. So um, this last year during the, um, I've, expanded from tuna on the tournaments down there as a, you know, as a tournament specialist on these, on, on this boat called the Rocky mountain hooker. And this was the first year where like the, the buzz, if you will, or the sort of excitement about being down there and being fishing professionally, was kind of like, okay, put that away, go to work. Right. And that was a, that's a, was another moment for me. You know, it's like, okay, you've this, the novelty has gone. You need to go to work. You need to work harder than everybody That's else out there, right? And you need to understand as much as you possibly can, be correlating all this data, real time, applying what you learn back into that day and the next day, right? So what I used to go up and have dinner and drink five beers at the bar, <laughs> right? I'd go up and have a rice bowl and a, and a margarita and I'd get out of there. Well, all the owners and, and some of the captains, but a lot, of, a lot of the owners are up there and everybody's like, you know, chest beat and we lost a fish we had the winning on you know whatever and usually you can't get much data but you can always find a sucker <laughs> so this <laughs> you know? is part of the sport too. yeah and you kind of you know you give them a little bit of let me buy you a shot of tequila information you know <laughs> and like somebody comes up oh hey how'd you guys do and you go no, no, okay you know and, but you stroke their ego a little bit next thing you know they're telling you a piece of information and you know you can't really trust everything but you get a little bit you know and if you know what you're listening to you can get data that they're not even trying to to tell you. Right. So, um, but yeah, the network dissolves usually during the tournament tournament season. It's like a poker game at that point. For Everyone's sure, everyone's holding their cards tight. Yep, yep. That's cool. So, yeah, the the different layers to the the competitive level of this, right? There's, definitely, it's not as simple as just going down there and hoping you get lucky. No, no. And time on water is the only thing that really can help you. And you know, you have to. You, there are foundational capabilities that you learn over time, you know, things that, that become inherent to the way you look at water, the way you read water. But then there are also the risk with that. You get fixated. You think that things are always one way and get too the, attached to the data. Yeah. And so for me being kind of new to this amount of repetition, this amount of time on the water, I have the ability to still throw things out when a lot of people just hard set, no way they never do this. Right. Um, if I observe something, I'm not afraid to put it in play. 
And I think that's made a difference in, in our success and just being willing to experiment, you know, and, and, and try new things while not throwing everything else out. Um, you know, again, the, it's one of those things is like kind of the, the guy who can learn and reapply information, uh, faster than, than the next is probably going to be successful, you know, and that goes for more than just fishing. You know, I mean, I worked to, for you as an executive at and Believe it. <laughs> Please. That's kind of the analogy you're showing me here. It's yeah. like that same shit that made me crush it in business. I use it in fishing. For sure. Um, you know, for me too, that was one of the reasons why I stuck with my career at AT&T for as long as I did. You know, I've, it was a grind, you know, I mean, I worked, I worked hard. Um, it wasn't, you know, they didn't hand it to me, but uh, I saw a lot of parallels in what I did for fun, what I did every weekend um, in my job as a leader. And I sort of started kind of wearing that, you know, that became sort of a mantra of mine. It's just like, you're a captain, you're a captain when you go to work, you're a captain when you go to sea. Um, and that, that kind of kept me going there, you know, but, mm -hmm. but it is, it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of parallels. That's cool. You know, one other thing you told me that I thought was super fascinating is the, how you learn from some Japanese fishermen, how to, now, now we're getting out of like sport fishing. We're just getting into let's catch a rad fish mm. and, and eat it. I mean, I love it. You love eating them too. Oh yeah, you know because when you're not you're eating all that. You bring me tons of fish, by the way. Thank you. For I sure. love when you bring me fish. But I thought it was super dope how you were telling me how the Japanese run the lines through their veins and de blood them in there. How does that work again? How do they do that? So there's this, there's a gnarly process that the Japanese have perfected, which they tend to do. Right? For all right. you people out there that love sushi. You know, this is, if you want the, this like, is the, the best way. sushi, the fisherman needs to probably be doing this. Yeah. So I met a guy, his name is Kusha. He's Iranian, but um, he lives here in, in SoCal. And he's trying to, to bring a fish from Southern California to market in Tokyo, which is not very often. It's, is it done? I mean, it's done via like commercial farming and, and other ways, but Eastern Pacific or call it California bluefin aren't really that popular in, um, in the East coast. And or sorry, in, in Tokyo or in Japan, A, because they're juvenile fish, but also B, they, they were not, they're not thought of as high quality. And so he, I met with him four years ago and he, when I was getting my, doing my commercial thing, right. So I could go fish during COVID. He brought me this kit and he was like, I want to buy your fish. I'll give you a good price, but you need to follow this to the T. And the process was gnarly. Like, I'm like, dude, I could catch three fish in the time that we do this process, right? You better have a good price. <laughs> um, so they, there's, it's called Ikejime, which is the process of terminating the fish. And then Shikejime, which is this process of um, basically taking all the, like you shut, it's the circuit breaker. It stops all electrical signals in the body. So the full process is you catch, you catch the fish and you're supposed to leave it in the water, resuscitate it outside. Okay, so that means that you need to somehow get a line into the corner of its mouth or a hook and you drag it and you let it recover from the fight. It just has fought its life, fought for its life. And you recover it. So it's like, you know, you just got done sprinting or running a marathon. You, you want to get its heart rate down. Bring it down, down and yeah. let, let, let the body release some of the lactic acid and that's been built up in the meat. And then you bring it, once it's recovered, you bring it in and you spike it in the head. This is the, the EKGMA part. And you shut it down and you pop and you pop its its ventricle, right? Or you find a way to bleed it. There's a couple of different ways. And then you leave it in the water again. And and what you're doing is, is they call it hydro bleeding. You're letting all the water blood out of its body. And then it brings in through those through these different locations that you hit. It'll actually suck seawater in. The heart continues to pump after the after the brain is dead. And you do that for a bit. And then you lift the fish on to, onto deck very carefully. Don't let it touch anything. You put a pad down, you lay these fish down. And then this is where you do the shike jime, which is you core out its brain. There's other ways to do it, but he gave me this cool core tool where you pop it right in its forehead and you re remove its brain. And we have like a, a seven foot long air aircraft cable and you go in and you can feel the top of its spine. And then you slide this thing in. This thing's been dead for 15, 20 minutes slide it along its spine and the whole fish will shudder all the way back to it's touching it. the nerves and you, yeah, you're right in the center of the spinal column right on top of the spinal oh, column. right on top of the spinal column and and slide it all the way and it'll bottom out at the tail and you pull it back out and that fish will not move again 
And what that does is, is it stops when, you know, when, when anything dies, the muscles will continue to, to contract. You put it in ice, they will, it'll actually shiver. Um, that shuts off all the electrical signals. So there will be no buildup of lactic acid and it also stops the death process kind of in its, in its tracks, mm -hmm. um, which is like where rigor mortis and things like that start kicking in. That process will extend sushi grade, um, for like a for fish that isn't frozen from the start by like five days almost it, or a week. It'll even. stay fresh sushi grade edible yeah. for five to seven more days. If yeah. you do that easily. And it probably tastes better in general, even on day one, it takes Just, this edge off of it. Um, mm -hmm. you get like a kind of a, almost acidic taste when a fish is really, really, you know, when it, when it gets terminated, mm -hmm. I've been doing it since he showed me the process shortened version, not hydro, not, not resuscitating it. Um, not always bleeding it in the water, but shortened process. And everyone I've given the fish to says it's the best they've ever had. Well, you so. gave me some belly ones and I, I think it's the best fish I ever had. And you had told me you had done that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And it's starting to become a, a thing now. Um, a lot of people are starting to do it, which is cool. It's catching you know? on. Yeah. I mean, why not take good care of this animal? You know, I mean, you go through the process of catching it and, you know, I'm not into just stack them as high as you can and then go put them in a Ziploc bag, throw them in your freezer and don't not Who eat Who buys it. most of your, I mean, is it sushi places mostly that are buying the types of fish you're catching? Yeah, our buyers usually are distributing to sushi places because they know about what we're doing. Um, but there are other places you go that buyers will take it. And you don't necessarily know, but it's not like they're they're not putting it in tuna cans. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, this stuff is is locally um, sold. So. Right. Nice restaurants, places yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's dope, dude. Yeah, I mentioned I go to a really I won't mention the name because it's kind of a sounds like a diss on this guy, but I have a place I go and he's a badass man. He's from Japan. I told him this. He was baffled. He never heard really? of it. And I was a little bit, come on, man. I think, you know, yeah, yeah. I think he, I think he was, a, he looked at me like, how dare you like put me on the spot? In front of my, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause I was just having a few sock. He's like, yeah, it's probably what you do. Right. And he's like, no, I, I don't know. I've never heard of that before. And I'm like, you know, it's funny. Okay, bud. Well, you better tune in. That's how the big boys are doing it. There's an interesting thing about about sushi and, and, and Japan. You know, you, when you think about Japan, you always think about there's like lots of history, right? That they've been doing everything they've been doing, you know, since the days of the samurai, right? Sushi as we know it now only came around once they could fly a piece of fish from the east coast of, of the U.S. to Tokyo in the same day. Mm -hmm. So, like... You're basically talking like invent of 747, like 1960 when, is sushi, when sushi became what we know today. Before here sushi, in the states, at, in Japan. Oh, in Japan, but, but I mean, before, they, before that, they they didn't have to fly it anywhere. They catch it in the ocean. They make sushi. Sure, but but sushi back before that was generally more fermented. That's why uh, they put wasabi on the bottom of your nigiri. Okay. That wasabi was there originally because you're eating a piece of fish that was pressed between two pieces of bamboo for like five days. And then they, they take the edge off of it, put it on a rice and give it to you. There's uh, a, there's a, there's a book. I can't remember the name of it. that I read It's really cool. It kind of tells the story of like where sushi came from and how, when it like really became this sort of like modern, old, you know, uber fresh. The way we know it. Yeah. Um, Japanese didn't eat, didn't eat tuna. Until the 1960s. I never knew that. Like they was like the bat. It was garbage fish. I a hundred percent was a guy who figured that as I'm eating this piece of sushi, I'm eating thousands of years of history. Yeah. No, from it's, <laughs> it's like, ha it's, ha it's happened real time. I mean, it'll, I'm glad they figured relative. it out. Sushi's the, the best. Dude. So good, dude. I, mean, I often, sometimes have to go get a burger after I'm done, you know, just to kind of like <laughs> you're still fill, fill, but <laughs> if I, I've always said, if I had to eat one food forever, I think for me, it would be sushi, you know? It's yeah. So good. I love it. It's I good love for it. you too. It's the other part. And, and you, what other meal can taste that good? And you know, like that was, that was probably really good for my body. Yeah. Yeah. Know? That's bitching. Well, um, let's talk a, a little bit about, I mean, you told your story about, finding your dream in life and you're living it right now. And I, and again, I just, I think that's amazing. So many people um, want to get out there and maybe try something and never figure out a way to get it done. But I think it's a story of, you know, follow your passion, follow your heart, trust that life eventually will open doors for you. It never, it never opens them in the beginning. It likes to see a sweat. That seems yeah. to be a part of the recipe every time, you know, some people think I'm going to quit my job and follow my dream. Well, get ready. It'll be like, the, you know, uh -huh. you know what I mean? <laughs> yep. I'm sure you had your moments in the beginning where you're like, 
I still Fuck. do. Well, I might as well start brushing up my resume. <laughs> I still do. You still do? 100%. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I was telling, telling my brother the other night on a heroic dose of mushrooms, I was like, dude, you know what? I said, I'm not looking for sympathy, but I said, but there's some sacrifices to doing this. You know, the lifestyle for me is much different. Fortunately, my wife is super, super cool and supportive um, of me making this choice. And, and, you know, but she's got a rule. You pay your half, right? I mean, we <laughs> you, your bills will still come. I'm not covered for you, right? <laughs> you know, I buy the, the six pack for 15 bucks and not the four pack for 15 bucks <laughs> when I go and get my IPA. You know what I mean? It's just different, you know, but it's. Well, you can't count on it. I mean, there could be a huge win. Yeah, and that's fantastic. 100%. But like, it's not like a corporate. You get your paycheck no matter what. Yeah, and you know, I've resisted the urge to to play the captain. You know, they they call it, you know, you get a good captain's job. You're on salary. You get some health benefits. Possibly, if the owner of the boat you know has a business, they can put you into their their deal, and um, you you get some stability there. If you ask the captains, they pay okay, right? There are jobs that pay six figures. Uh, most of them don't, and. As I came into this a couple of years back, I came in with like the almost the attitude of like, I don't even need this. Right. And I've kind of held that and it's been tough. But the reason that I did that was because I wanted to fish as much as I possibly could. You end up on a job where you a captain's job where you your job is to take care of this guy's boat. He might fish 10 times a year, 20 times a year. Wow. That's it. Right. And then you just take care of his boat. Right. Well, I get got to fish 120 times in, in a year, right? Because I was prepared to work on a number of different people's boats and just sort of uh, held that, you know, I've, I run a 55 foot Hatteras for a guy uh, in Arizona called the Real Fast. I've got my my boat, 31 foot uh, Testadura, which is hard headed in, in uh, Italian. That's uh, what it stands for. <laughs> um, and then I've got the job on the Castigo and, and then the, the tournament job down down south on the rocky mountain hooker and so with all with by by holding that sort of attitude of like i don't need the job i get to fish more which is giving me the repetition that i need to prove my skill to not just to myself but also improve on that as 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 i go Mm -hmm. and time on water is everything but now you have gaps, you have variability in people's schedules and maybe they're you know castigo's getting paint and a new deck that thing's not gonna come out until may Right. So I don't jump back to the Harris. We've got a lot of projects. Guy's cool that we're in the off season right now. I've been working for him, but um, the stability is gone mm-hmm. and it's uncomfortable. No lie. Mm-hmm. Right. Especially because I still have a, I mean, my lifestyle has changed, but my family lifestyle, we still have mortgage. You know, we, right. we, we, did a massive remodel, you know, eight years ago, we're st- still paying off, you know, and I have a Tesla, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so um, I'm living a different life in a way, you know, I mean, I brought back a lot of my lifestyle, but but the, the stability has gone and uh, I'm trying not to sell out and to say, I'll get a regular job, not just in within uh, the corporate world, but, but I want to continue to, to refine this skill. I see it as something that, that, I can bring something to, you know, and, and so for me, it's time on the water. It's, it's that technique and that repetition that brings, brings it home, you know? So, well, it's going, you know, it's one of those things you're, you're living a dream and a passion and right now it's working and until it's not working, why change it? You know? So keep on trucking. Yeah. Right. And you mentioned something in there, um, a heroic dose of mushrooms, you know, everyone who, who knows me knows that I, uh, I'm a big believer in plant, plant medicine i i've had some really profound moments in my life with lsd and, and mushrooms and um dmt and and uh, i don't do those things a whole lot anymore and if i do it's really with some pretty clear intentions yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know hanging out with you and you telling me some of the techniques you've deployed with with mushrooms was uh i was like damn because you're you're doing some some very let's put it i oh, got yeah. you a hat yeah, I want to. It's, I think it's hats time, on. time for this. These, these cool hats I got, everybody. Fuck microdosing when you get macro. I've right? been telling people that. Everybody's like, yeah, I've been microdosing. I'm like, yeah, that's not really my style. <laughs> <laughs> no, you. I don't know the numbers, but one day we were tattooing and you were just like, oh, yeah, I, 
I uh, well, first of all, you're soaking it, and then you're doing the lemon tech, so it's like it, it hits you in like 20 minutes, and there's no digestive issues, so it's direct and fast, and mm-hmm. none of this slow come on and drop down. It's just wham. Yeah. And I think you were, I think you were doing like eight grams on a dose or something, which is like a lot. It's quite a bit. <laughs> and then you're like. But you also talk about it, like I've had some heavy doses like that. And you were like, I was talking to my brother that after day after a hero dose of mushrooms. I'm like, you talk to people? <laughs> <laughs> you obviously, your yeah. body must be com- more comfortable working with these substances. Like I, I take a dose. It's been a lot of years <clears throat> since I've had a large dose, large dose of mushrooms. And I don't remember being able to function in that way. I mean, I was okay, yeah. but I was alone and there was no talking. There was no flipping a movie on and kicking back. I was yeah. searching for my soul in the backyard. You know, I'll see you guys in five hours. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> you know, I think that's one of the things that, you know, you and I have talked about this before. It's like a lot of people do mushrooms to fix something or they're seeking to fix something. It's kind of like an ayahuasca trip. You like outline what you're there for. And I think that's cool. But a lot of times I don't try and outline what I expect from the universe in general, in life in general. Um, That's kind of how I am. I'm going to let it, let the story write itself. Um, I'm going to let the universe provide. Right. And so a lot of times you go out and you just have a really good time. Um, One thing about mushrooms is like, once you have a certain amount, there's a long period of more where it, before you get to like, you're out of your own body, right? Like the differences aren't always that much, but um, I really like to see shit sometimes. <laughs> I just like, oh, I want to like be able to close my eyes and be like, well, that's rad. So sometimes we'll take, take quite a bit and um, or most of the time. But the other thing too is lemon tech as a process that you mentioned um, where you grind up the mushrooms and you soak it in lemon juice or lime juice and stir it for like 20 minutes. And then you, you extract it. You take it through like a cheesecloth and you just take what's left of it rinse it a couple of times and you get like a little shot glass of, of fluid. That process um, is kind of wasteful sometimes. So like you, there's still a little bit in the, in the mushrooms. You don't eat the mushrooms at that point. Right, you right. put them away. So um, you can be a little bit more aggressive, right? With the dose. But um, yeah, Scott and I have had an interesting one the other day. We, we went pretty deep and we ate them. There were new ones I got and uh, they were, they were pretty gnarly. <laughs> but it was cool. You know, I mean, it's, uh, I've, I've learned a lot. I've been taught a lot. I have been informed, like you say, um, it's, uh, become part of my life. You know, it's, uh, it, maybe it's my religion, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, in a way, like it's, it's where I check in, you know, and, and, um, like I said, without expectation, I'm, I'm listening, I'm open. Well, that's, that's the secret to all hallucinogenics, man. Every bad trip, I never really had a bad trip. I've had bad moments that I kind of had to kind of get my shit together. And really what it always comes down to with hallucinogenic experiences is uh, letting go. It's just, you try to control it. The tighter your little grip goes, the more it, it does, you get more uncomfortable. And it can be really point, scary. And it can be very scary. But yeah. as soon as someone does that, I'm like, fuck it. I, I, I'm i going to be okay. I'm just going to see how this goes. Let it happen. Uh, it just the whole, I mean, I mean, on some of my trips, I've had imagery like on DMT where I was doing the control thing. I was like, no, I don't know what I, just this vibe of like, I try maybe stop it. I, I would like this to stop. Mm-hmm. And everything's literally red and fiery and aggressive. And then from having done these things enough, really clicking into don't try to control this. And as soon as the thought goes through, all the red and fire goes away. And it's just like, boom, clouds and blue yeah. and peace and this overwhelming sensation of love and gratitude. And I just think that's, uh, it's just a, it's a microscopic view of what you're doing in real life when you're not on mushrooms. It's showing you that. Yeah. It's, it's kind of teaching you, like, do you see What's happening inside you on a molecular level when you are in resistance to what is. Right. right. You don't want this current moment. It is what it is. Facts are facts, whether you believe in them or not. Mm -hmm. You know, life is your life. The situation, whatever's around you, it is. Now, how much are you going to fight that? How much are you going to resist that? You can do it all you want. But at some point, usually as you do that, uh, the circumstances will increase and get what you resist will persist. And eventually... Life is just going to 
tighten around you to the point where you finally give up and just go, fuck it. Yeah. Take me. And well, you know, think about like, what, what is anxiety? Right. right? Like in, in people in society today, they're, they're trying to, they're, you're trying to control things that you can't control, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, like, like I mentioned before, you know, I think it's, uh, it's part of that process where you're, you, you're going to let the universe decide you, you, you are not like, and I don't necessarily recommend this, but, but I haven't had a plan in my life almost ever. Um, I used to meet with a, a guy who used to be, a he was a CIO and his mentor of mine. I, I sought him out and said, Hey, you know, can, can you meet, you know, I used to have lunch with him, you know, and he'd be like, yo, you need to have a three-year plan and you need to have a five-year plan. And he goes, this is how I was successful. And he'd say, you know, you map it out and you go after it. Right. And, um, you know, I'm not always good at taking advice, <laughs> you know, and I, it's not been in, in my nature, you know, and I think it's part of the reason I've been, been happy is that I've just let things be what they are. Um, and I, I take advantage of opportunities as they come and I, I seek to have no regrets and I, and I have no regrets, you know, it's because a part of that. The other thing is when you're in like a, you know, on a high, high dosage, um, you know, they talk about ego death, right? Yeah. And ego death, well, the, the scary part that holding on mm. is you going, wait, what's about to happen? I'm about to no longer exist and you can feel it. You can almost, it's tangible. You're no longer in you. You're now everything. Yeah. And it's freaky. Like you say that let go, mm -hmm. it gets, it, it starts to make you better. But, but, um, one of the things that I've learned too, as you kind of come back from all that is that the biggest gift in life is the fact that you have one. Your ability to be you, to be an individual and to be independent of the universe is the biggest gift in this life, right? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we are all everything and then we're us and then we're all everything again. Yeah. And, and so that fear this, that it's, it's teaching you like that's what the gift is. So you're going to go be everything again for a little while and then you're going to come back to being you. Now celebrate that wasn't, isn't that bitching, right? Yeah. And cherish this moment, this time that you get to be now as an individual, I call it and the, 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 it is everything, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Janine, I came to this with Janine one, one night after I was, I went deep and I was pretty freaked out. It was actually the moment where I decided I wasn't going to go back to the real world, um, real world working. Laying on the floor, and my, 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 she was sleeping. We we're watching a movie. I took too much. Um, and I'm like, Janine, I'm like, I need your help right now. Right. I'm pretty, pretty grounded, strong, pig headed son of a bitch. Like, don't need my wife in like physically help me moments very often. Right. And I'm like, she wake her up. I'm like, don't freak out, but I need your help. I'm freaking out. Anyway, we ended up laying in the living room and, and I'm like, you know, like, it doesn't matter re religious or not. Like, there's something, right? Like, why everything? Why stars, planets, universe? Why? Like, not why us. Why life? Dude, why every, why any of it, right? Mm -hmm. There's a light switch somewhere where it's like on, off. And, and when it's on, it's everything that is here, right? That's the it. Like, there's an it, that's controlling that. Maybe that's God. Maybe that's whatever. That's it. Well, when we're here, you and me, we're independent. This is my feeling. We're independent versions of that bigger reality, that bigger everything, right? We get to be that. Everything is that, you know, trees are that, plants are that, like life is an independent version of this bigger thing, you know? And I couldn't agree more. That then that 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 description you just gave seems to be the the, the message I get every time I do these things. It's, right. it's on some level in different ways, and I I see it the exact same way you see it. And I I view me, Aaron, and you. We, this is just an opportunity to look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing to be like if if you're a tree, and you're like I'm a beautiful oak tree. You know, you're an oak tree. But when you kind of want to not be the oak tree and stand a hundred yards away and look at yourself. Yeah. 
and see your trees blow and see yourself from a distance. And I, I think that's a little bit of what's going on. We are the whole thing, but the whole thing wants to create little apertures to go into and yeah. play with itself. Learn about itself. And learn about itself and look at itself. And then that's what I think of when I go out and you're on a beautiful hike or something. I get it. It's nature. But I feel like I'm just looking at me and, and look how beautiful it is. Look that's how right. beautiful I am. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yes, I can't merge with the clouds when I'm dead sober. I mean, there's little inklings of it. Uh, eat enough mushrooms and you will. Yeah, sure. Um, and if you want to have that experience, that's one way to maybe get that for an hour or two. Yeah. But once you've had that message, it's hard to view life any different. And you're right. And then when you come back into you, your name, your job, all this me, body, meat, everything, the gratitude and appreciation from just being alive is exactly. enriched so much. It grounds you in, in a in a way that it's hard to describe, you know. And and again, you know, you, you think about this again, a concept of of losing your ego. Well, like, does that mean you should be less egotistical? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Celebrate the fact that you have one. Yeah, that's what this is about. You know? That's funny you say it that way, too, because when I first started studying Buddhism, it seemed like they were saying the job, if you study hard enough, is to get rid of the ego. And I, like you, arrived at a place where I'm like, it's not about getting rid of your ego. It's about understanding what it is. Yeah. And how you fit in everything. And how you right? fit in it and then enjoying it. Because you're not going to – the idea that you're just going to hit this bliss state where you're walking around in a human body completely detached from ego. Yeah. I've never met anyone. They, there's books that say some people have done it. I don't – I mean, maybe you can do that. I don't even know if that's what I'd want to do. Having an ego is part of life. That's having right. a personality, having opinions, being good at something. And yeah. that's your ego. But understanding it, what it is, put it in its place. Know that it's not your whole thing. Know where you came from, where you're going back to. That's right. And just enjoy that little momentary blip. I mean, hell, a human life, 70 years, it's like a fucking nanosecond in, in the, that's right. in the yeah. universal perspective. Active. You get these little, one little blink of an eye, your eyes open, you get to play around for a second and back you go. That's right. So yeah, the gra I think gratitude, gratitude. And yeah, I, I'm glad you talked about that. That's one of the things I appreciate about it. And, and knowing you, I can tell you're a person who's done these things because you live that way. I'm sure this works. I mean, fishing in general, I no mean, wonder you're attracted to fishing. You cannot control. This yeah. is like one of those sports where you have to be with the environment you have to okay that's not working you have to let go quickly that mm -hmm. you can't hang on like you said earlier no the map says we're supposed to be here great it did yeah. but it's not now we're going here right. you know just letting and like you said you're always open to like i don't really try to make a plan i mean i have a general plan but i'm always listening i call it listening to the wind oh the wind shifted boom plan a is gone we're going to plan b like yeah. this this way you think and, and the way you use mushrooms, I'm sure it really does make you a hell of a fisherman mm -hmm. just on that little, little sub chapter, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. really dope, dude. That's cool. I always say the hardest decision I, I make is like what to have for dinner. You know, <laughs> everything else just feels right. And it just ends up happening. Right. Um, and sometimes you go, well, that worked. Let's try it again. Right. <laughs> Hence the, you know, first big fishing tournament I ever did and we won it and, we we ended up winning the the next one we did, which is in September up here the, in 2020, and knocked out another one. And I was like, I want to do this. And we've shown up, but we haven't really done super good since then, you know. But but um, but wow, it's been a ride, you know. And what's going to come tomorrow? I I don't know. I mean, I'm probably not going to take up skydiving because it's not like really there right now, you know. But like who knows whatever's next right mm -hmm. um you know i'm i'm uh consulting a little bit on a on a project an esport project that uh, i've been working that, on yeah. for a few years and um helping them in in designing their their strategy for for go to market and i enjoy it it flexes this old muscle that i have you know what i mean and and then that's why i do it you know it's mm -hmm. uh it's been fun and i've learned a lot you know what I do next would be probably for that same reason. Yeah. So, yeah, I like it. I like your philosophy. I like, um, with, with your life and, and you're, 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 you've got a great life, man. And you're, you're a truly happy, content, peaceful man. And I can't say that about a lot of people. And I know you, 
I know that. I mean, just watching you get tattooed. I often tell people, man, and we'll t- we're going to talk about tattoos there in a second, but I swear to God, and I don't mean getting a little tattoo this big, but when yeah. you start, you know, drilling on people for five and six hours for multiple sessions, it's very revealing how they probably live their own personal life. And, and it's just, you get the people that just fight, even if they don't give up there, you can feel it in their energy. They're fucking around their shoulders, their neck, they're grinding their teeth. They're kind of like, can I get some water? Uh, can, yeah. I don't know about this music. The mu- <laughs> you know, there's just, you can see, yeah, yeah, I can watch sure. them. They're running. Yeah. And there's nowhere to run. And, and they know it. Like, you've got 25 hours to go on this piece, dude. That's happening. You can wiggle your way through this and grind your teeth through it. But it's funny with you because I know who you are and how you live your life and everything you just said. And I watch you get tattooed that way. You chill. You just, I know yeah. it hurts. I'll you, bet you've seen that, though. It, it, it is. It's interesting. I remember the first, I mean, when we first started doing this leg leg one, I mean, you do what do you call it? The line first, the outs, the, yeah, out, the whole line. outline of it. Yeah. So you laid it all out, you know, oh, and this is funny. So, um, I told you before I, f- I forgot my thong today and, um, figured you might have some more for me. <laughs> I don't know where it went. I lost it. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we have we to not, work in some up, up in the, we're going to be in tight today. today. <laughs> right. This is the last area. Um, but anyway, so I, I show up, you know, I've got trunks on and, Aaron, you'd give me a you'd give me a drawing, you know, and and uh, of what it was going to be. But it was just kind of like you know, you're, you're just throwing ideas up, you know. And um, so they're like, okay, cool. So I get here, I'm in trunks, and you're like, got anything on under that? And I was like, no. Nah. Like, we we gonna need to go higher than that? And he's like, oh yeah, dude, we're doing your own fucking leg. <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> Should have known when I called him. I was like, this one's yours, Aaron. Do whatever you want. I'm down for whatever. Right. And he's like, and you go, don't tell me that. You're like, yo, bring out some of those thongs. And I'm like, thong. Okay. And, How deep uh, we going? So when you, but when you did that full, you know, you, you, you know, you hand draw it on. I mean, which is like, that's one of the things I think is really cool about your style. Cause you just, you know, you kind of get down, you're almost in a meditative, meditative pose, you know, your legs crossed. Yeah. And you just start hashing, you know, and, and, um, I'm like, fuck, we're going to do this whole damn thing. Well, that, <laughs> that outline is, is the only time in the process where you, where you you get hit everywhere. Right now. It's, yeah, it's you're from not the top painting all the way to the bottom, kneecap, yeah. back of the knee, ankle, hip, groin. Right. And so it's like, Oh wow. Okay. That, that's <laughs> the most intense session. And it gives you the, f- yeah, you get oriented like, okay, this is going to be, this is where it's going to be. And, and, um, I remember thinking like, okay. Uh, and I read this book about this book called breathe, you know, and it talks about your breathing in, in a variety of different things in life, but your breathing is also kind of how you can meditate and also how you control pain and things like that. You know? So I was, <laughs> I was like reciting some of the stuff from that book and that, that day, you know, and I'm thinking, oh man, that was gnarly. And since then it's been easy, but like you said, it was probably, that's the hardest day. Well, you did breathe. You did relax. You so, didn't fight it. You did do everything you just said, how you live your life. You, you, you just accepted this is what is yeah breathe one breath at a time it isn't gonna kill me no. i will walk out of here today you know it is and uh and you've dealt really well and i just think it's a it's a testament to how you've how you live your life and i think it's great and i think these things mushrooms help i mean you're probably th- that way by nature but those things can't hurt and yeah. and you know on that note the piece that we're gonna and we're gonna be shifting gears here in a sec because we are going to finish your leg sleep today today's mm-hmm. our final session um the design you're about to see um you know grant came to me he he, he did he didn't say anything he was just I'm like well tell me where you're at and he was telling me the story about you know i left corporate america and and i just kind of leaned into my instincts and my intuition and i i'm a professional fisherman now i just won this big tournament and all that so i'm just taking in this info <clears throat> and um so the piece i drew for you it might seem just decorative, but it isn't. Like what it is, is it's water moving down your entire leg. Big movements of water, Japanese finger wave type water. And then behind the water is a, you could call it a mandala. It's a geometric pattern that emerges from behind the water out, from his kneecap out, all the way up the leg and all the way down. You guys will see this in a minute. But to me, those were the two represent, one is representing your life as a fisherman, the ocean, in that mandala, the geometric pattern, and I don't know if you feel this way, but man, when I'm tripping hard and, and I see those patterns, mm-hmm. I 
it, they're not they're not just patterns they're communication mm -hmm. it's a language yeah like i and you it's not with words but like a pattern will show up and i hear and i hear like like telepathy a message in the pattern and i sometimes guess that at the most advanced levels out there in the universe that the really advanced beings i think are talking with these things or they embed their data in them or whatever but to me it kind of echoed your your journey as a psychedelic explorer yeah. so that th there is purpose behind this it's not just decorative and, yeah. and and you loved it and i thought it was cool because you didn't really tell me to do that i just kind of rolled with who i know it, what i know of you yeah so there's yeah. a little background on the piece we're going to do today it's a black and gray piece it's totally different from probably most of the work you guys have ever seen from me which was also sure. fun because yeah. i'm like i want to do something different I'm, i don't want to do it, a snake and i want to do something just wildly and you're like dude i don't care do whatever you want and so i ran i went this route and i love the piece I think it looks dope. I think you love it too. But um, it. all right. Well, with that being said, we'll we're going to come back over and I want to talk about my gift today too. But I think for now, let's take a break. Let's go over to the other side. Let's let's finish up this tattoo for you, and then we'll come back over. Have a maybe have a whiskey or something for sure. Until I got tequila too. All right. All right. All right, brother. Stoked. Let's do it. Boom. <laughs> pain level it's fine it's getting some of those strokes are getting in there close with your uh, junk there yeah it's a little, watch this getting a little nervous there, you go. <laughs> <laughs> there is a little spot in here where i can feel it all the way up into my chest it's like a pipe it's like a you know like plucking a plucking a guitar string or something it was weird nerve or something aaron says so they're all connected a big neural network Welcome back. How was that, my friend? Oh, that was a piece of cake. Yeah? Yeah, compared to the last six sessions. I mean, it was kind of deep groin. A lot yeah. of people have issues with... Uh, I was, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I was, you were I was mentally prepared. It was shading. Shading, um, and never a guarantee on this, but usually yeah. more chill. Yeah. Not like was, outlining and pure black and all that shit. Totally. I mean, like we were talking about earlier, the black, the, the initial outline was gnarly. But everything else has been good since. Although there was one spot, white, right in tight, where I could feel it vibrating all the way through my chest. It was like a just a, a nerve ending or something, but I felt it here yeah. as you were doing it. Not pain, but like uh, I could almost feel like the needle like vibrating my entire core. Yeah. That's a weird system. I've yeah. had that. That's a weird kind of feeling. Yeah. Um, you brought me a gift. I wanted to yeah. show everybody. So you probably correct me, but I'll just say this is a swordfish sword. Yeah. Is that what a, it would be called? Swordfish's bill. Um, bill. So, yeah. Yeah. This is a swordfish bill. And I mean, if, I don't know how well you can see that, guys. I would have swore on a holy Bible that that was a piece of wood. I mean, it even has grain in it, like wood. But this is the, yeah, this is, so this this is where the head, where these broken parts, this is where the head of the fish would have connected. Yeah. So this would have been right like that. That's right. Yeah. And, this, and this is the thing they, they they attack other fish with, they fight each other with, they dig through the dirt and find food with it. Yep. Yeah. So the swordfish are like, they're belligerent animal. I mean, they, they I don't remember how to pronounce their, their, uh, their scientific name, but they're, it's the scientific Latin for the gladiator of the sea. Hmm. Um, they're uh, fucking wild. They will attack anything. Aggressive. Super fish. aggressive. More uh, aggressive than a shark. With each other, with their prey. If they don't understand something, they use that to touch it and figure it out. 
Mm. Um, so you, like on this, you'll see there's this edge here. There's there's ser almost serrated. Well, that used to be clean. That's where they are hitting either other animals or or rooting around in the in the mud. Uh, they feed at the bottom in thousands of feet of water and uh, come up to kind of warm up and digest. Mm. Um, we caught this one in like 1,200 feet of water with really deep, deep set rig. It's a new technique that's being done on the West Coast. It's been, doing, been done on the East Coast for a long time. And that's actually the first swordfish that uh, we ever caught on our new, on our boat, um, Testadura, my brother and I, and, and our homie Chachi. Dude, so, I have trouble even taking a gift of that nature, dude. You know, I look but, at it like it was a milestone for us. Why yeah. not pass it along? And it won't be the last, so... Well, thank you for that. Thank for sure. you. And it will be, I've been thinking about it since you gave it to me. And I talked about out front there. Ah, it's going to go right, I think, above those books, right on the Sick. wall right there. Right so on. this is the latest trophy in the Chats and Tats podcast room. So it'll Rat. be, a lot of people will be able to enjoy it. It'd be one thing if I stuck it in my house somewhere and I see it only every day. Yeah. But there's going to be a lot of people that are going to enjoy it. Cool. I figured you'd, uh, figured you'd enjoy it and... Talking uh, to my brother the other, the other weekend, I was like, "Hey, what do you think about we give that that sword to, to Aaron?" He's like, "Fuck yeah!" So I'm honored cool. and grateful. Thank you, thank you. Right on. And I guess what you know, I want to close it out by saying, "Look, a tattoo journey of this size—it's something I talk about on the show a lot. It's special. It's—I uh, often liken it. And I, I shouldn't probably—I should probably quit saying this. Like two people who went to war together, and I—I got to stop saying that because those guys are probably going through way more than I go through, but. There's some similarities. You're in a lot of pain. I'm working. We're trapped in a room. There's no, you know, we aren't on our cell phones or yeah. just me and you talking about life, bonding. And I think you're a perfect example of my, the thing I'm most grateful for in this 30 year career is at the end of it, I have friends like you in this world yeah, that yeah. are friends for life. And so for sure. thank you for being a, a rad dude. I mean, letting me do a, a really creative project, something way out of my wheelhouse, but mostly thank you for, you know, the bond and the friendship, man. I really appreciate it. Most definitely. Dude. It's been, a, been an absolute pleasure. You know, my first tattoo that you did for me, um, it's been like 12 years, maybe longer. I used to, when we first met, basically, right? Yeah. Um, and realized all these connections. I mean, I found, got, the only reason I got on your schedule is because of Holly, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, you know, realized Jason and all that other stuff. And anyway, um, I remember going home and telling, telling my wife, I was like, you know, I'm, he's like on my level. Like we just, we, we connect and I'm like, and I feel like I'm like, walk out. I feel better. Like it's almost <laughs> like therapy, you know? Um, but really, you know what it is? It's like a fucking podcast. It is. Every time, the microphones. Like, we're talking and we're back and forth for a few hours together. We're yeah. having a really good conversation and we're going deep and we're contributing, you know? And, and so this is a natural progression. I'm really stoked for, for you and stoked to be a part of it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's a privilege to, to be on this show with no. you, dude. It's rad. Thank I'm you. Ra it's rad that we got to finish the piece on the show. And, you know, on that note, though, I often say to my clients, and I'll ask you this question. When's the last time you sat with your wife, the closest person to you in your life, for five and a half hours, sat your phones down and just talked? Yeah. And, yeah, I, and point. you probably never have. I don't know if I have. I don't. Maybe. I don't maybe on a vacation, but we're not, we're not really, we're going to the pool, then we're going to the room, then we're going to dinner and we are talking and hanging out all day. Yeah. But I'm talking like no distractions, no yeah. pool, no drinks, no dinner, just, yeah. Hey honey, sit at that side of the table. And, and I'm going to sit at this side of the table and we're just going to look eyeball to eyeball and just talk about life. Right. And the answer with all due respect is nobody does that. People don't do that. No. They don't do it with their best friends. They don't do it with their parents. They don't do it with their wives. Yeah. So it's a very unique experience that, yeah. and, and sometimes barbers, and no offense to barbers, like that's what we do. I'm like, yeah, it's 45 minutes, bro. It's a little different. Mm -hmm. 45 minutes is ice breaking time. You totally. don't get to the deep material till like hour three, yeah. not to mention the intimacy of the, the pain and the sometimes nude. It just, puts people into a more intimate mindset to where suddenly you just, I find myself dumping my deepest secrets in these sessions. And yeah. so do my clients, you know? So it, it, that whole process is rad. And um, <laughs> thank you for, you know, you know, you, you're, you're mentioning it. Yeah. Well, you and I just had a full conversation and I was in the gangbang position I mean, for <laughs> 20 minutes or half an hour of this whole thing. I mean, that it was interesting. Straight faced. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I had a big wad of Vaseline in my works. It yeah, gets a little like weird. All, already, like, you know, <laughs> I, I where's the knock on the door? Here we go. Oh, fuck. That's funny. Um, we didn't. We didn't have a gangbang. <laughs> Everything you're going to see on the Definitely set not. is what really happened. Um, well, buddy, I guess at this point, all that's left to do is a toast to us, our friendship, a brand new tattoo for you. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers, brother. Love you, man. Love you, too. Mm. Oh, before we leave, if it even matters to you, um, where can people find you? I mean, you're you're obviously you're you you're a professional fisherman, but you also take people out on chart. I don't know. Is there some information you want to share with the audience? Um, yeah, I mean, I do. I call it limited charters, which is kind of based on a sort of pecking order of of, uh, of folks that I work for and, and operate for. Uh, I do do take people out on my boat on Testadero on thirty one footer. So um, I'm on Instagram. Uh, What's your Instagram handle? Stay salty San Diego. Okay, stay salty San Diego. People could DM you there. I'm assuming. Sure. Yep. That's I mean, the best way. if you're just looking to go out and get drunk all day and catch some, um, you know, sculping, probably don't, <laughs> don't don't hit him up. But if you're interested in going out for a day or two or more and trying to snag some trophy ass fish, yeah, hit this man up. Um, he is one of the gnarliest fishermen I've ever met. He knows what he's doing, as you've already heard. So. Yeah, it's kind of a life experience thing when when you come out and fish with me. I mean, I I fish hard. Uh, my brother fishes really hard. Like when we go out, we're gonna give it legit. We're gonna. It's give not it a party. Twenty percent. It's not a party boat. I mean, you can party, but I'm gonna work. I mean, we when we go on long trips, we push the envelope for the for the boat. I mean, it's a thirty one footer. We go anywhere. If, within a hundred miles. I mean, nothing, nothing's going to stop us. If there's a reason to do it, we go. And, uh, and we make our own bait, which a lot of guys don't do. Um, which means we operate at night, uh, near islands. And so we, we use lights and we capture our own bait. We keep those flying fish I was talking about earlier alive and use them in the, in the process. And so it's a, uh, it's crazy. It's a grind, um, mm. for most, but I've never had anybody walk off the boat and wasn't like, dude, holy shit, like that was fucking, a, you know, an event, you know what I mean? And right. it gives people uh, a little bit of insight into like, you know, kind of, I don't know, maybe just our style of fishing, but but it's it's pretty intense. No, I, I get it. It's it, I, I said it before. If you're going to go fish with you, you're going to get the real experience of what pro yeah. fishermen and how they do it. Yeah, for sure. Which I think is, is awesome. And I'll be doing it with you this spring, summer. Summer, let's do it. I'm going to hold you to that. Well, you got it. All right, everybody, that's kind of the end of this one. Please, if you're digging the show, go to YouTube, give me a follow, leave me a comment. Check me out on Apple Podcasts. Check me out on Spotify. Again, rate me, leave me a comment. And uh, that's it for now. We'll see you on the next one. Peace out.